Well, first of all, thank you everyone for having me today. Um, and my students also thank you because the fact that I'm here at 9.30 in the morning on a Saturday mean, meant that for them that they get to turn their papers in late. They, they had an extension till tomorrow. So uh, thanks from both me and my students. Um, before I begin talking to you, I want to talk a little bit about the activity we're going to do and introduce you to the components that we're going to have. Each pair of people will have a, a little container um, that has a bunch of ingredients in it. Right now I want you to open that container and take out all of the components. These components are going to be shared between two people. So each person gets one of the little containers of vinegar, tiny container of vinegar. Each person gets a packet of salt. And each person gets two hopefully dirty pennies. Okay? We have some paper towel on the side just in case you have any spills or need to wipe your hands. And there's going to be a point where we're going to clean things up. Now that that container is empty, that container is going to be your little workstation so that if you have spills, they're not on your desk. Okay? If anybody is without a kit, I will let you have mine. Anyone missing one? Okay. So what do pennies have to do with Flint River water? Do any of you know? Well, today you're going to find out. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, what was in the Flint River water? You guys have all heard about what we had in our water, correct? What did we have in our water that was a problem? I don't hear it loud enough. Yeah, you, you said lead as if we had like really tiny amounts of lead in our water. But we had lead in our water, OK? We had a ton of lead in our water. Um, and so today I'm going to try to help you understand how that lead got into the water. What happened as a result? You've seen a lot of what happened on TV, but TV doesn't always give you the full story. I lived through this. I work at the University of Michigan Flint. I lived through this. My students lived through this. My colleagues, my boss has lived through this. Our children have lived through this. Um, and they're not giving the full picture to everyone. So that's the story I'm trying to share. But before I start, I want you to know um, it's about what happened. And I'm not going to talk about politics. The University of Michigan Flint, um, because I work there and want to keep my job, I have to stay out of the politics. So no questions will be answered uh, pertaining to who to blame. Um, or where to point fingers, okay? This is a scientific talk, and I will talk about the science for you. So we'll talk about what happened, what the side effects were. Now, in the news, you see some of the things that happened with health and the environment, but there are additional side effects. There are side effects to the economy within our area. There are side effects that are going to be long term all the way through our future through at least the next 80 years. And then most importantly, I'm going to talk about what you can do. And I'm going to talk about what you can do in a multiple ways to help us in Flint, but both to protect your, uh, help us in Flint now and to protect yourselves in the future as citizens within communities. OK, so what happened? What happened was chemistry. Chemistry has to be approached from a systems approach. I happen to be a biochemist. And in the, biology, in, the, in the biochemistry, we understand that every time you put a chemical within the body, it impacts not just one little thing within the body, 
but it impacts multiple systems. So you have to consider what the systemic effect is of what you've added or what you take away, okay? That's easy to see, correct? Our water is the same way, okay? And when you take drugs, when you take drugs, what do you learn about before you take the drugs? What do you have to consider? You always have to consider the side effects of the drugs you're going to take. And just like taking a drug can have side effects within your body because it goes through your whole system, when you change something within water, you have to consider the whole system because there will be side effects too. Now for those of you who might be in chemistry, you can think of, you know, when I add something like silver chloride to a hydroxide solution, you know, what's gonna happen? Nobody remembers from Gen Chem? We get a little precipitate, okay? Um, but if I start pushing in more chloride ions, what happens to that precipitate? It tends to go away, it's a common ion effect. Um, and Le Chatelier's principle comes into play. Now, for those, the rest of the people in the room who aren't in Gen Chem or organic, I'm not gonna bore you with those kind of details of chemistry, that's not what this talk is about. This is a very different kind of scientific talk. I'm gonna talk to you more about things like pennies. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to open your little container, the little container of vinegar, and I want you to open your little container, your little packet of salt, and I want you to put the salt into the vinegar. to the vinegar, I want you to take a look at one of the pennies. Actually take a look at both pennies. Take a look at both of your pennies. See how they look, kind of record in your mind, don't have to write it down. What do they look like? And go ahead and put those into the container and put the lid back on. Very good. They, yep, both pennies. They don't have to say, be the same kind of observations you're taking for your organic lab when you're making white powder every week, okay? They don't need that level of detail here. This is not, this is not that class, okay. So, I want you to shake it because we need that salt to dissolve. Shake it, like really shake it. Like, if you have that cap on, it's going to shake really, really well without getting all over you. Okay? Now we have to All right, all right, all right. In order for everybody to hear me, I need you to stop and just put it down now. We, I think we shook it well enough. <laughs> and what I want you to understand, first and foremost, is that what happened to us did not happen on purpose, okay? What happened to the city of Flint did not happen on purpose. A lot of people think it did. Some people in our community thought that people put lead into the water, okay? This is not true. The government is not trying to totally get rid of the city of Flint by adding lead to their water uh, after the fact, okay? I, yeah, I can't tell you if the, the government's trying to get rid of us or not, but it's not because they added the lead to the water. It also didn't happen because the Flint River is this dirty, nasty river and everybody thinks it's so gross uh, because GM used to be there and there's all this kind of runoff that has happened from the factories over long periods of time and made the Flint River dirty. The EPA actually made us clean the Flint River up from all that runoff many years ago. So it wasn't that the Flint River was so dirty and had the lead in it and we started using the Flint River water that caused the problem, okay? It starts back in the 1960s. In the 1960s, Flint used to use 
water, get their water supply from the Flint River. But they no longer felt that they could continue to do that efficiently. Their water treatment plant was costing them a lot of money. And Detroit was getting great water from Lake Huron. And so what they did is they started buying water from the city of Detroit back in the 60s and had a pipeline that came up from Detroit. It came from Port Huron or Lake, Lake Huron into the Detroit treatment plant and then got shipped up to Flint where it came to our treatment plant and was then distributed. And that worked well for a very, very long time. However, the city of Flint was in bankruptcy. We were $25 million in debt, and therefore the way our government is structured because of that debt, we were assigned an emergency manager to take over the city instead of our elected officials. And the emergency manager had to find ways to cut this $25 million deficit. We had to find ways to save money. And he started looking at what expenses were out there that were expenses that shouldn't have been as they were. And what they discovered was that Flint, a city in the middle of a state surrounded by fresh water, was paying the highest water bills in the nation. Okay? We were paying the highest water bills in the nation when we had water all around us. And they said, this is absolutely ridiculous. So they decided that they were going to have to look for other ways to get their water because paying so much for water when we're surrounded by water makes no sense. So what did they do? Anyone know? What was the plan? Because this was on the news. They sourced from the river. Why did they source from the river? It was cheaper. They didn't source from the river because it was cheaper. They sourced from the river because they had a uh, less expensive option, but it was going to take a year to get to that less expensive option. There is a new pipeline being built into uh, Lake Huron for some other communities, and Flint was going to tie into that water system to have their own supply direct from Lake Huron, just like Detroit does. Okay. So that, that's being built right now. It's still being built. Why they tied into the Flint River water is because they still needed to save money in the meantime. Well, Detroit found out that we were going to tie into this new system and stop buying water from them. And they didn't like that because we were their biggest customers. We were giving them more money than anyone else. So what did they do to, to, to uh, make us, to punish us for leaving them? Well, while you're going to wait that year for that line to be hooked up, we're going to jack up your rates. Okay? So they increased our uh, cost of water even more. We were already the highest in the nation. So the emergency manager said, whoa, 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 we can't let that happen for a whole year. Our, our residents can't handle that. What have we done in the past? And that's when they decided to go to the Flint River water. Okay? So they went to the Flint River water because it was previously a source of water. And it was only supposed to be temporarily that we got our water from the Flint River. Okay. Um, so they went ahead and made this change. Now to understand the impact of this change, you also have to understand a few things about water. Okay. There are big differences between lakes and rivers. And without even thinking of chemistry, what do you think a difference between a lake and a river is? Stagnant versus flowing. Is that what you're going to say, too? OK, lake water sits where it's at. River water flows. What do you think the difference is in flowing water versus water that's sitting still? Oxygen aeration, OK, everything gets picked up a little bit differently. When something's sitting still, everything settles to the bottom. And in lakes, the chemistry of a lake varies depending on the depth that you go and how close you get to the minerals, OK? In rivers, because they're constantly moving, they're constantly picking up minerals. 
and circulating everything that's within them and moving them around. So this affects the water chemistry, okay? What is pH? pH is an important part of water chemistry. Anybody in here have a pool? A few of you. What are some of the things you test in your pool to make sure you have good water quality? You test for chlorine, algae, and pH, okay? So those are some of the things. So we'll start with pH. pH tells us how acidic something is or how basic it is. But most people understand acidity a little bit better than, than basic. So what we found was that uh, what we know intuitively in general is that lake water has a higher pH than river water, okay? And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, don't think, I think, there we go. Okay, so higher pH actually means it doesn't have as much acidity, okay? Why would lake water not have as much acidity in it? Where does acidity in water come from? Where does the water in the lakes and the rivers come from? Precipitation, rain, okay? So rain, sometimes our rain has acid in it, okay? So if the rain has acid in it and it gets into a river, the acid doesn't get neutralized so well because there's not as much of it. Lakes tend to be bigger. The bigger factor dilutes it out. But there's another reason why it doesn't affect the lake as much as the river, and that's something called the alkalinity here, okay? That alkalinity is a little different from what our, us as chemists think of the term alkalinity. Alkalinity in the water chemistry world actually means a, a measure of resistance to change to addition of acid or removal of acid. It does not mean the same thing we think of in our chemistry classes. So in chemistry, we call this buffering, okay? So lakes, because they have a lot of carbonates in them, tend to have a much higher ability to resist change when that acid is coming into the system. So the alkalinity is higher, it also makes the pH be higher as well, okay? And lastly, um, and just to give you some numbers, um, according to Mark Edwards, who's the person who's doing the most research on this, actual hands-on research on this right now, um, the most rivers have a pH that are, is less than seven, um, and the Flint River generally has a pH of around 6.4, while lakes tend to have pHs around 7.5 to 9, and Lake Huron has generally a pH at the point where they're taking the water to use for water systems of 8.4. So difference between 8.4, I'm sorry, 6.4 and 8.3, 6.4 for the Flint River and 8.3 for Lake Huron is a big difference, okay? But lastly, we have chlorides. Chlorides are a lot more arrows. Why do you think I have a lot more arrows there? Chloride levels are low in lakes because they don't flow as much, okay? Rivers pick up more of these chlorides because they flow and because they take a lot of um, the uh, water that comes off of roads, okay? Why would water coming off of roads make um, Rivers have higher chloride contents. Because in Michigan, we salt the crap out of our roads during the winter, okay? We way over salt our roads, okay? And those chlorides then wash into our rivers very easily. So um, I have read accounts um, that somebody has a, a problem with significant figures somewhere because I'm seeing that the difference between chloride levels in Lake Huron versus the Flint River is either nine times or 90 times. So somebody has a problem with significant figures, which is a huge thing in, in chemistry. So those of you taking chemistry, sig figs, that's always gonna ruin your day um, if, if something does. Um, so I believe it's, it's closer to nine times. The, the Flint River had nine times the chloride levels 
of the Lake Huron water, okay? So when we switched water, we had a lot of change in chemistry. And we were used to getting water that was pretty darn clean and we didn't have to worry about that. Um, so along with this, why this becomes important, and I'm gonna have you at this point in time go ahead and take out one of your pennies and put it on a paper towel and dip that, actually dip that paper towel in the water in this container. There's a container of water that I want you to put in the middle of the, the big cup so it doesn't spill. Take the lid off and put one of the, take and dip, dip your paper towel into that water. Dip your paper towel into that water and you're gonna take one of the pennies out and clean it. I want you to clean one of the pennies. Leave the second penny in there for now. look now? Shiny. Shiny? What happened to it? it? It dissolved some of the dirt on the outside, okay? Maybe some of the, the copper oxide rust on the outside, okay? So it looks kind of shiny compared to what it looked like. Once you're done cleaning it, I'm going to have you put that penny into the water, into the water and leave it there. That's our control penny. Because in science, we always have to use good controls. And I actually left out one of the controls today because I ran out of pennies as I was preparing all these uh, with my students yesterday. Um, we would have had another control that just had the penny in the water the whole time without ever being in the vinegar, okay? So with the second penny, what I want you to do is I want you to take the lid off and hold the lid to the side so that you have a little bit of an opening that the penny can't get through and pour off the vinegar into the large cup that doesn't have the water in it. The one that the water's sitting in, that's like our waste cup. Go ahead and pour it into the waste cup. Decant it off like that. Just, yep, in that part. Go ahead and pour it off. Okay, go ahead. And not into the water, into the bigger one, into the waste cup. And go ahead and close it up. like sisters today. <laughs> Poor Edith. Okay. So, now that we talked a little bit about now that we talked a little bit about the river water and the lake water, what do you think the vinegar represented? The vinegar represented the acid that had increased in our water. What did the salt represent? The chlorides that were in our water. And what I want you to think about is the fact that this is not the first time a big population has been poisoned by lead. 
due to acid and minerals. Is anybody, can anybody tell me what happened to the Roman Empire? Why did the Roman Empire collapse? Their plumbing was lead, and for a long time they were fine with that, right? They didn't, they didn't collapse right away. Their plumbing, having those aqueducts lined in lead was not a problem. But they had a really big victory that they were celebrating. They had this great big uh, celebratory time. And what did they do during that celebration? They did drink too much. Yes, they did. And that's, this, is, this is key. They drank too much. What did they drink back then? They drank wine. So to celebrate, they took and replaced the water that was going through the aqueducts with wine. Okay. So the wine was flowing through the aqueducts. Okay. How would you say the wine compares to lake water or river water? Which one do you think it's most going to represent? Why river water? It's acidic. Does it have minerals in it too? That might be chlorides and other things? Yeah. So it's acidic. It has minerals in it. And so the, they, they know, they didn't understand how back then, but they know that lead got into the water because they added the wine to the aqueducts. And this is what caused the Romans to go insane, um, completely uh, have deterioration of the mind, and the Roman Empire fell. Okay? This is not the first time this has happened. Um, and I, I, I think that that's a really good analogy. So it was a change that caused it to happen. If we would have continued to get our lake water and never switched to the river water, we would have never had a problem. Lead pipes were not the problem. The problem was the change of the chemistry flowing through the lead pipes. So I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit now. Okay. And this part is a little more chemistry than the average American has to deal with on a daily basis. But I'm not going to make you memorize uh, redox equations, I promise. No mechanisms here. Um, just a few things that I want you to know, OK? So for the chemistry students in the room, lead. Lead is a metal. It says it's insoluble. What does that mean? It's insoluble. It doesn't dissolve in water. Lead is a metal. I can take a sheet of lead and dip it in water and it'll, it, leave it there all day long, weeks, nothing will happen to it. Okay? But that's not the only form of lead that exists. Lead can take on other ions and make salts with different ions. It can react with oxygen in the air and form lead oxides. What other things react with oxygen in the air to form oxides? Iron. And what do we call that iron oxide? Rust. Rust. Okay. So this kind of stuff happens every day. Okay. Okay. Some other forms of, of that lead can take are lead phosphate. Lead phosphates are not um, soluble in water. So if you have lead phosphate and you take a bunch of it and you put it in water, it won't go away. But if you take lead chloride, and you put it in water like you do sodium chloride, it's very soluble. So what will you see happen? How do you know when something's soluble? It disappears. It dissolves. Okay. So what I want you to remember right now is that lead as a metal is insoluble in water. Lead as a phosphate is insoluble in water. But lead as a chloride is soluble in water. Can I get you to remember just those three things for the next 45 minutes? <laughs> Who agrees? They can remember that for 45 minutes. Oh, come on. I need more people to remember this. You're going to remember it twice for a few other people. OK, thank you. Thank you. I've got people volunteering to remember for others. This is awesome. So um, I need you to remember those three things. So this is where it gets a little tricky. A few words.
words that were in the news that confused people and made it so that they weren't really understanding what was going on. And I really believe the government was trying to confuse people at this time, though I have no proof, are the words trihalomethanes, inhibitors, and orthophosphate, OK? So a little bit about our change. We switched to the Flint River water in April. In May, people started saying, this water is weird. Uh, 2014. In May of 2014, people started complaining, this water is a little bit weird, OK? It has a smell. It's a little bit discolored, a little bit orange, which tells you what's probably in it. Rust, so some iron's in there, OK? Do we worry about iron being in the water? Not really, OK? Um, but then they started saying, well, it tastes funny, and it's getting cloudier. And so the EPA started doing tests. And the first thing the EPA finds out is that Which EPA state was tested? Uh, it was state, OK? Um, the state EPA uh, tested the water, and they found that they were having high coliform concentrations. And high coliform concentrations told them that there were microbes growing in the water. Who likes to drink water with microbes growing in it? Anyone? No one wants to drink water with microbes growing in it. So what do we do to get rid of those microbes? We had chlorine. What do you do in your pool when you want to get rid of microbes? You had chlorine. I overchlorinate my pool. I'm not going to lie, OK? I overchlorinate my pool because I'm a biochemist. I'm a little paranoid. So they kind of did the same thing. The public said, what? There's bacteria in our water? you got to do something about that. So they added the chlorine. When they added the chlorine, however, the chlorine acted like it would in a pool. How many of you have a pool and can tell when your child pees in the pool? I can tell when my son peed in the pool when he was younger, OK? Because I overchlorinate my pool. And my pool would suddenly start turning cloudy, OK? <laughs> it would start turning cloudy because that chlorine would start to interact with the organic materials that were there that have a lot of carbons in them and make a cloudy precipitate, OK? So water was still cloudy, but they were fine for their coliforms, though. But then came back, well, it's still kind of weird. So the EPA tells us, you've got trihalomethanes in your water. And this is where I started freaking out. I'm not going to lie. I started freaking out. What is a trihalomethane? This is a trihalomethane. In fact, they were telling the public it was, TTHMs are in your water. OK? Because words like chloroform are not things you want to hear in your water. OK? And my EH&S professional on my depart in my campus did not know what a trihalomethane was. They said, EPA says they're trihalomethanes, and they'll take care of it, and it'll be OK. I said, but trihalomethanes are chloroform. What does anybody know about chloroform? We've all heard of chloroform. What, where do we hear about it? As a preservative? Where do we hear about it in the movies? It knocks you out, OK? It knocks you out rather readily. Do you want to drink? something in your water that's going to knock you out really readily just from breathing it? Yeah. So I was already like, OK, I'm not trusting this situation. And this is the point where I stopped drinking the water. OK? Um, so I didn't drink the water for as long as everybody else did. So now the EPA has to address this, because now the public's really panicking, because they don't know what TTHMs are. And they would have been worse if they knew what TTHMs were. So we just let them think they had TTHMs. And in order uh, to get rid of that, they had to put in some inhibitors to the TTHM. What do you put into your water in your pool when it's cloudy? I saw people with hands up when I asked if you had a pool. 
Somebody other than me has had to have had a cloudy pool before. Nobody lets little kids in their pool? You guys are mean. OK, so um, when you want to get rid of that cloudiness in your pool, you put in what they call a flocculant. OK, a flocculant is a really, really fancy word. And when I go and pour that flocculant in my pool, that cloudiness goes away and starts to settle on the bottom as a rusty colored little pile of stuff that I then vacuum up and my, my pool is no longer cloudy. They did the same thing at the water plant. They added this flocculant. The flocculant is ferric chloride, OK? Ferric chloride, iron chloride, OK? So why don't we just add to the water more chlorine, OK? And something that not everybody would be able to recognize about ferric chloride is it's also more acidic. So we made the water even more acidic. It had even more chlorine in it, but it got rid of the cloudiness that they could then filter out at the water station. So the water was looking better. Water was suddenly looking great, OK? So the water looked great, and they were feeling really, really good. Yeah, all right, the public's going to leave us alone. OK, so inhibitors and orthophosphate. Well, let's talk about where this orthophosphate, this is going to be another inhibitor that they should have added, OK? And I want you to understand why I think they should have added it. Thanks to CNE News, I have beautiful uh, visuals for you, OK? So our pipes, whether they're made of iron, copper, or lead, that have been underground delivering our water for many years, have on them what is called a mineral passivation layer, OK? So your dark color, dark brown up there, is your lead pipe. And then this is minerals that have grown up there and deposited themselves over time. And then on top of that mineral passivation layer, and it's not shown here, is also a coating of slime. You didn't want to know that, did you? Okay. But that coating of slime is actually there, and it's OK. It protects you. It's, it's good. Don't worry about the fact that there's slime coating your pipes. It's a good thing. When we added all this chlorine, what did it take away? It took away the slime. Okay. The chlorine automatically took away the slime. Now, these mineral passivation layers in an iron pipe would be made of iron oxide, which is rust. In a copper pipe, it would be made of copper oxide, which you had on your penny initially. Okay? In a lead pipe, it's actually something that builds up over on the pipe and usually takes at least 10 years if you have a good amount of water running through it. And you have phosphate in there because lead oxide won't stay behind so well. But if you have phosphate present, what do we remember about lead phosphate? It's insoluble, OK? So we had lead phosphate as our mineral passivation layer. And we were fine as long as we were able to keep that lead phosphate there. But all of a sudden, we're flooding through our pipes Water that is highly acidic and has a lot of chlorines in it. Now, those in chemistry, Le Chatelier's principle tells you you don't have much phosphate around. Everything's always in an equilibrium. You increase chloride concentration, which also can bind to your metal. What's going to happen, chemistry students? Chemistry students, I know there's a lot of you in this room. Sorry to pick on you so much today, but you need to help us out here so the public knows I'm not lying to them. What happens? Shifts the equilibrium. So instead of keeping the lead phosphate, we start building more lead chloride. What do we know about the difference between lead phosphate and lead chloride? Chloride soluble, phosphate is not. So if it's soluble, we then have lead chloride that can get into the water, OK? 
Did we go the wrong way? We did. Okay, so that was that reminder. Okay, so this can happen on all of the pipes, okay? Lead, iron, or copper. So we have all these chlorines. It starts to take away that passivation layer. That passivation layer, that lead gets into the water. But then we also have now our lead pipe exposed. And our lead pipe doesn't have any phosphate to add to it. It only has chlorine or oxygen to attack it. So we can get more oxygen taking that lead out. We can get more chlorine taking that lead out because we are in an acidic environment. And so we get more lead into our pipe. Okay. Was the problem the pipe? What was the problem? You can't get at that lead. You want to make sure you keep it protected. And changing to adding so much chlorine in an acidic environment was the problem. The pipes weren't the problem. The water was the problem. The chemistry was the problem. This also happens, as I mentioned, with lead pipes, copper pipes, and iron pipes, OK? Iron pipes, when there's a lot of chlorine there, will also start to lose their passivation layer. And what a lot of people don't know is that after we started replacing pipes and started doing more testing of the homes based on what kind of pipes they had in their homes, guess which pipes leading to homes had the most lead in them? Homes that had iron pipes or homes that had lead pipes? How many of us think it was homes with iron pipes had more lead? How many of us thinks it was homes with lead pipes that had more lead in them? My two young people over here who uh, agreed with the iron were the correct answer. So lead service lines coming from the uh, plant to the homes and then iron pipes within the homes. What do the iron pipes have on them? Rust, OK. Rust, when you see it on the car, is it flat and just pushing against your car? Or is there like bubble? Does it get bubbly and like more like a sponge? Bubbly. bubbly and more like a sponge. So the lead, I'm sorry, the iron passivation layer is like spongy. And over time, as tiny, tiny amounts of lead, tiny, tiny amounts of lead over many, many years had been getting into the water, just because that does happen. There's always a tiny amount there. It would accumulate in that iron pipe. And it would get held there in that iron sponge. But the change in the water to a corrosive, highly chlorinated environment caused the iron passivation layer to come off as well, which means that all that lead that was in that sponge rust was going into people's houses. Okay, So the iron pipes are a bigger problem than the lead pipes. Okay, What kind of pipes do we have in our building at work? Galvanized. And galvanized pipes have? A whole lot of iron and other metals. So this is still plaguing us today, OK? This is still plaguing us today. Now, they could have avoided any of this happening with the lead pipes, but probably not the iron pipes. They could have avoided it with the lead pipes if they would have added, instead of so much chlorine, they could have added that much chlorine, but if they would have added more phosphate than chlorine, the phosphate would have won over the battle for the lead. And the lead pipes would not have been torn apart. The iron pipes might have still had problems, OK? But what could have stopped the iron pipes from having those problems? Having less chlorine and less acid. So when they added the, the iron chloride to precipitate it out, if they would have then neutralized that back, added a neutralizer to take away that acidity, they would have avoided the lead 
or the iron problems, which leached more lead, okay? Sounds pretty complicated now, doesn't it? Yeah, everybody thinks it's only people who have lead pipes in their home that had the problem. It's the people who had the iron pipes that had the worst problem, okay? And they're not telling everybody that. So this all, all happened um, over 18 months. 18 months without any corrosion control, okay? During this same time, I was in a very unique situation. Our labs were being renovated. Our whole building, which was built in 1988, started renovations in uh, May of 2013, okay? In uh, April 2014 is when we turned to the Flint River water. So it was after we had started renovating the building. On um, August 29th of 2014, my first labs on the fifth floor of my building were complete and done with renovation, and we moved back into our labs. So it was a few months after this change, just a few months, and I was teaching a lab at that time. I was really, 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 really super, super excited to be teaching in these new, beautiful labs that I had wanted for such a long time and had designed and am still proud of these labs beyond belief. They're like my baby and I have two children. Okay, um, they are my pride and joy and my daughter who is a college student at the university now knows still that those labs are above her um, because they are that awesome. But I was teaching and I was so excited to start teaching in that lab. I started teaching that fall and on October 28th, we did a spectrophotometry experiment, and I don't expect everybody to know what a spectrophotometry experiment is, but it just requires that light's able to go through a solution and be able to be detected, and it has to be a colored solution. So we were making our colored solution out of a compound called copper sulfate. Copper sulfate, when you dissolve it in water, it makes a beautiful <coughs> copper sulfate, beautiful blue, which is my favorite color, so I chose copper sulfate to do this experiment. Beautiful blue solutions. And my students were making these solutions. And what's supposed to be these beautiful solutions that you can see through like, like, like you can see through glass were very, very cloudy. Very, very cloudy. I'm like that's not right. So I did a little research being a chemist on why that would be, and found that there were four possible reasons that this was happening. And it all had to deal with the sulfate this time. And the four things that can cause that to happen are lead, which is not good for people, barium, which is not good for people. Strontium, also not good for people. Uh, and then the fourth one doesn't even matter. I mean, the fourth one was yet another heavy metal. It was silver, also not good for people, but not as bad, okay? And I, I was really, really worried. Now, notice I'm talking about October of 2014, right after the tri trihalomethanes were in the news. And they were still worried about those trihalomethanes, really, really, that was like everything everybody was focusing on. And I went to the person that I thought would be the best person to tell that there was another problem. And I now know that wasn't the best person to go to. I went to the best person I thought that would be able to address it for me which was our environmental health and safety officer on our campus. And I said, I said, Mike, I need your help. There's something wrong with this water. 
And he says, yeah, there's, there's trihalo methanes. We're working on it. The EPA is working on it. I promise I'm working with them every day. They're, they're guaranteeing me they're taking care of this. I said, no, Mike. I'm having another problem. And it's a heavy metal. He said, no, 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 it's the trihalo methanes. I said, no, no, trihalo methanes are organic. I'm talking stuff that's inorganic. And he's like, no, no. E EPA says everything is okay. E everything is okay. You can't be right. You don't know what you're talking about. In July of 2015, we were still being told our water was safe, even though lead started being detected in homes of February of 2015, several months after I had already seen the problem. We didn't turn back to Detroit water until October 16, 2015 which was almost exactly one year after I already knew the problem. The reason I say this, and the reason this is so important for you guys to understand, is because I should have pushed harder. I should have been the voice for my community. I thought I was doing the right thing. I was told to keep my mouth shut we can't put the university's reputation in danger with the city. I should have gone to my boss instead and told her to go to the dean and the chancellor and anybody else that she could go to to get people to know what was happening so that my whole city was not poisoned for an extra year. And that's why I'm here today, because I want to make sure this doesn't happen to other people that you guys know what to look out for. So I want you to know what the side effects are of going through such a situation. And some of these side effects, like I said, the media has brought great attention to, such as the health effects. This child became the poster child for the Flint water crisis. Unfortunately, I can't remember his name at this time. Um, some of those health effects were easy to see because you'd wash your hands. And I have eczema on my legs, and that is a problem. My skin's constantly peeling off. That was nothing compared to what I was experiencing by washing my hands at work. My hands were bleeding because it was so corrosive. Not because of the lead. Because the water is corrosive. That's why people were seeing skin problems. But the lead was also affecting people's immune systems, making them more susceptible to having skin issues. But there's so much more to it than just what you can see from the lead right now at the time, OK? And you got to think, Flint is a community that is already living mostly in poverty. And what that means, many of you might not understand. To live in poverty means you don't have access to transportation every day. It means you don't have nearby good health care to access. You have poor education because teachers are constantly leaving or being fired because there's blight in the city and there's not enough students to keep the teachers that are even good. They live in poverty already. And then they hear about lead. And they don't know what it means. And that's why they thought people put the lead in their water. And they could see the outside external effects. But they don't know that when they're pregnant, that the lead is possibly changing the developing fetus. That children, infants drinking formula, are going to have neurological effects for a lifetime. That the elderly who are already susceptible are going to have greater health effects from the lead. Because those of you who are chemistry students understand that heavy metal ions affect a lot of enzymes in the bodies in a lot of ways. But it also affects our nervous pathways so that new nerve pathways aren't going to grow. 
So they have all that against them just from the lead. And there's over 8,000 infants and children that are going through this over that 18 month period. And when that last six months of that 18 month period, till this day, their families are stressed beyond belief. And who detects that stress more than anything? The children. The children detect that stress from their parents more than anything. And so not only do they have harmful effects from lead, but they have the harmful effects from the stress. Stress in a developing person can also lead to, lead to cognitive function issues later in life, okay? These are things not being advertised on all of the media that we see. This is not what's, what we've seen. So we have to worry about their growth, their behavior, their intelligence, and even fine motor skills that they're going to lack. For me, as a, a, an instructor at a major university in the town who does everything she can to get more students to be taking chemistry that come from this background, I worry about my classroom in 10 years. I'm going to have to have a completely different skill set to teach these students than what I have now because they're going to need more attention. They're going to have different ways of learning that I haven't been trained to do. I was trained as a chemist, not a teacher. And so those health effects are going to go on until that generation of people are gone. 18 months affects that whole generation and that whole community for about 80 years. There's the environmental impact. Thank you so much to all of you who immediately got behind us and started sending us money and bottled water. It was so needed and is still needed till this day. Even though we switched back to the Detroit water, as you can see in 2015, we switched back to the Detroit water. We've got that clean water coming through our pipes again. We're still rinsing through all the lead that was there on those unprotected pipes. So we still need that water. And even homes that have water purification systems, which when I first gave this talk was really what I pushed for, people to stop sending water bottles and start sending us water purification systems. Because the people don't trust the government that's installing those water purification systems, they still won't drink or shower in that water. So they still need that water from those water bottles to cook, to clean, to bathe. But all those water bottles are building up. Um, this, this, is not, this is not a fake picture. This is reality. You get off on Hamburg Road from I-69, and there's this big wall that used to be there that people used to graffiti all the time. It's now the big wall with a stack of water bottles in front of that. We got smart after a while and started having recycling stations at the same places they were distributing the water, but there are problems with that. Not everybody can even get access to all this bottled water that we have, and we have like rooms like this filled with bottled water, I kid you not, for distribution to our citizens. But not all of our citizens can get there. We're talking neighborhoods that don't have transportation. We're talking about elderly who cannot walk all the way there and then carry cases of water back to their homes. And when you impose on someone to go ahead and take you to get that water, are you going to impose on them a second time to go ahead and take the recycles back? These are very pr proud people. And they don't want to impose more than they have to. So that is a problem. Um, some places have gone to serving boxed water instead of bottled water. A little safer, okay? But that boxed water is $2.50 a box instead of, you know, 75 cents for a bottle. So it's not really affordable. Um, 
but I really liked that when I saw that at a restaurant. I thought that was really cool. No longer can you get free glasses of water. You have to pay $2.50 for a box of water. Okay? So restaurants are getting a little more expensive than Flint, even though we have no money. Um, but the economy has been affected, and it's easy to see how a restaurant would be impacted because people go there and they have to eat and drink from the water that's in the city. So this is a restaurant in downtown Flint that I was having lunch with my chair at one afternoon, and we're like, whoa, what, what the heck is this? Um, they had stopped using those boxes of water. It was the same restaurant that had the boxes of water. They finally had the EPA, or he had the health department come through and certify them as lead-free so that uh, people can trust to go to that restaurant now. But all of the restaurants have been impacted because it does cost them a lot more to have these bottles of water or these, these um, cartons of water. And people don't, just don't want to come to Flint to go to these restaurants anymore. And that's easy to see. But there are some things that aren't as easy to see. OK? Oops, wrong button. Housing. Nobody wants to buy a house if they can't even have access to fresh water coming into that home. Or an apartment. Apartments within the Flint community are advertising when they have Detroit water versus whether or not they switch to the Flint water. Because everybody thinks all of Flint had it, and it was just the actual city of Flint. This is Mount Morris Township. We see things similar in Flint Township, which did, never did have the water change. Um, but there are others. What are some others we can think of that might be impacted by water? Yeah, we didn't see these on the news. What about doctor's offices? Doctor's offices, they have to have clean hands and wash their hands often, don't they? They have to have water available at a pediatrician's office when that mother needs to make her formula, when they need to wipe down a child. Okay, doctor's offices are impacted. Schools are impacted. Everything is impacted. Down to the gyms. Gyms lost memberships because people didn't want to shower in the gym anymore, OK? Every business was impacted. My business was impacted. Brand new lab, brand new sink. Brand new sink. What do we see? That's iron. But since it's iron, it's probably also lead. Nowadays, I'm quite sure what's coming through is mostly iron with the lead embedded in it. But this is what comes out of my water, OK? Brand new sink, $37 million renovation. This is my favorite, because this is a safety issue within my labs. Brand new, beautiful hoods. Most beautiful hoods on the planet, they are Michigan blue. Um, <laughs> They are true view hoods like you guys have here because we're copycats. And the vacuum breakers for the water, and those of you who don't work in chemistry labs, in order to make sure chemicals don't get back into the water system, they put special vacuum breakers on the taps so that water can only go out and can't come back in so it can't get contaminated. And that's what that is up there. And it works by having a gasket that has to seal. But when you have particles coming through with that water and they get stuck on the gasket, the gasket doesn't seal. And so these drip all over the floor during the lab period. And the biggest hazard within a chemistry lab, those of you in chemistry labs, tell me what the biggest hazard is. Slip and trips and falls, OK, from water being on the floor. So how cool do you think it looks that our brand new, just open, renovated $37 million labs um, are looking when the, the public comes in to see what they spend that money on and they have plastic cups hanging from them so that I, I don't have a safety hazard. Does that look really nice? What about you as a student if you're touring my labs and you see, you see such things? What are you thinking? This place is pretty shabby. <laughs> uh, what about you as faculty members or employees that are looking for jobs and you come into my labs and you see those sinks and you see the cups hanging from the hoods. Is that very inviting for you to come work there? 
We've since gone through two searches for faculty members, and fortunately, we were able to get a very, very awesome inorganic chemist. Um, thankfully, he wasn't deterred by such things. Um, very thankfully. And then the time it takes to maintain things is changing as well. Because in my brand new faucets, this is a faucet aerator. You guys have these at home on your faucets. Do you have to clean them every month? Do you have to take your aerators out because they have so much sediment getting stuck in them that water just stops flowing? Your sinks and your bathrooms stop working? Your toilets won't flush? For those of you who are scientists, your autoclaves won't autoclave because they can't get up to pressure because the water won't come through fast enough. I have to clean these monthly. I have hundreds of them. I need almost three more people to do my job because of this. But I don't want you to feel sorry for me because I'm in Flint. And even though this has been a rough road, and it's still a rough road for us to go through. I'm originally from Detroit, and I've lived in Lansing, and I've been all over the country meeting other people, and in all my travels and everywhere I've lived, I have never met a more resilient people than the Flint people. Flint has been through so much being beaten down throughout the years that they know how to fight back and to get where, and get back up to get where they need to be. Flint will come back from this. It's gonna take a lot of time because it takes time for that phosphate layer to grow back and they're trying to replace the lead lines and hopefully they do a great job. They, they need to replace over 28,000 lines in homes. Um, that's gonna take a lot of time. But we will get there and we will, we will get past this and we will take advantage of it. As a result of this, people are gonna understand more. Scientists are, are gonna be able to under, better understand the effects of lead on a population. So that when this happens in another community, they know what protective measures to take. They know what kinds of education to put those children through to have those effects from that lead minimized. We have mindfulness classes in elementary schools now to help the students know how to control their inner feelings and emotions to deal with the lead and how it makes them just more, um, not aggressive, but spontaneous. Almost, it's almost like ADHD effect, okay? To help them be more calm. We have a lot of resources, a lot of research going on, and this, this Flint community, they're gonna do it. They're turning in the, the samples to be tested. They're pushing for things to be better, and they're okay with being the guinea pigs. They don't want this to happen to other people. But unfortunately, it is helping, ha happening to other people, okay? Um, people are helping us, or at least they were in the beginning. It's really slowed down. We don't have as much water coming in. We still need it. Um, if you want to donate money to the, to the Flint water crisis, please make sure you're going to a reputable site because there are some people taking advantage of it and making money off of the Flint water crisis that they should not be by uh, creating fake funds for it. If you still want to contribute, uh, the GoFundMe page for, from Virginia Tech has been discontinued, but the United Way of Genesee County still has the Flint water fund. And um, the Community Foundation of Greater Flint has the majority of the monies for long-term helping of the community and the health effects. We are teaching our, our, our uh, people to have healthier foods, moving more grocery stores into the area so they have access to fresh foods. These are the things that are happening as a result of what happened to us. But it's still happening in other towns. St. Joseph, Louisiana right by Tulane University, kind of by New Orleans. Uh, back in, over the summer, I saw a CDN thing that, they compared it to the, the Flint water thing, but said, oh, it's only iron. They're only having a problem with iron. I called Tulane's chemistry department, couldn't get a response. 
called their admissions department, nobody cared, called their eh &S department, finally got through to somebody who understood what I was saying, saying, hey, I'm from Flint. That, that iron you're seeing is the first sign that you're going to have lead next. Contact Mark Edwards. Mark Edwards is now uh, sampling their waters, and they are starting to have the same problems we are. Don't know if they'll get through it as easily as we would. This would have happened in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ann Arbor would have fallen apart. They wouldn't have known how to come back from it because they're not as resilient. Hopefully, St. Joseph is. In addition to trying to help those that are already going through this, you need to make sure it doesn't happen in other communities. There are many, many ways to do this. One is like becoming like me and being an ambassador for science. Yes, I have the ACS to thank for this. They encourage me to be an ambassador for science. Um, but you don't have to be the ambassador for science. Um, you can just start trusting scientists and make sure that those that you elect know that you want them to trust scientists. Consider this. Scientists spend generally 12 years training, paying for training to be educated in their field before they're allowed to start working in their field. How many of you have hairdressers that have done the same? Do you trust them to cut your hair? How many of you have kids with teachers that have trained for 12 years? Do you, do you trust them to teach your kids? How many professions, you yourselves in your jobs, how long did you have to train to do your job? Do you do a good job? I would hope nobody would go to work and, and purposefully do a bad job. But scientists, we had to persevere through 12 years of college after school to do what we do. We're well trained. We know what we're doing. And yeah, there are a few bad apples out there like there are in any profession. But of, and if any pr a profession should be more respected than it is, it should be the scientists because they have to go through so much to get there. Make sure that the people that you put into positions know a little bit about science. Make sure the pe person who's running the EPA understands the environment and, and things that can impact it. Make sure that when children are young, we stop scaring them and telling them how scary and hard science is. Science isn't hard. Everybody has something they're great at. Everybody has something they can be passionate about. We all learn differently. And I'm not saying let's turn every kid into a scientist, but let's make every kid not afraid of science, willing to learn it so that when they grow up and become adults, they can make informed decisions so that they don't have lead in their water supplies. Make sure that you're not afraid of science. Talk to a scientist. I'm a scientist. I'm a human being. I'm a person. I didn't get up here and dress all fancy because I'm a speaker. I don't do that very often. I don't do this. I'm like really, really nervous right now that I'm doing this. Um, I'm just as nervous as anybody else would be up here. But this is such an important topic to me that I couldn't pass this up. Talk to us. Learn how we think. Learn why we say the things we do. Learn why the science changes, because we question everything. We doubt ourselves more than anybody could ever doubt us. OK, that's what scientists do, because they look at things from so many angles. They're afraid they missed one of the angles. OK? Become an ambassador for science. Those of you in this room, I'm assuming, are all probably OK with science and don't feel, fear science like a lot of people you know do. And so what I ask you to do is when you talk to somebody that does fear that science or says something negative against science, to educate them a little bit to understand that science is truly, truly only in their best interest. We don't do things on purpose to make things bad. We want to make the world better. What I want you to do now is one way to 
understand uh, how to explain to people the importance of science is I want you to look at your penny that's been sitting covered up in your container and compare it to your penny that's been sitting in the water. What do you see? What's gross about it? Anybody else say their penny's gross? Why is it gross? What's happening to it? What do we see? It's not oxidized. What has happened here? is just like the acidic water with the chloride ions in it that went through the flint pipes. The acidic water with the chloride ions first went through that first passivation layer of dirt, then got through that second layer of just copper, and now you're seeing the layer that's underneath that copper. And I'm sorry if any of you got pennies that are 1982 or older. We really worked really hard to pull all the 1982 or older pennies. If you got a penny that's older than 1982, you might not see this, but it's starting to turn black because underneath that copper, that copper is electroplated onto zinc. You're now seeing the zinc underlayer. That's what that black is. And that's exactly what happens to copper pipes iron pipes and lead pipes when they're exposed to high chloride, high, pH, uh, uh, high acidity concentration or environments, okay?